Assalamu alaikum and welcome to MacFest 2021. I'm your host, Asad Zaman. I'm the principal of a private college, the Tuition College here in Manchester. And I'm also an imam and commentator on Islamic issues for the BBC and other media outlets. So that's my intro. Now let's just do a little intro into this, uh, this session. Now in this MacFest 2021, already we've had traditional music from around the world, uh, a celebration of uh, Bangladeshi culture, also Muslim women in science, medicine and management, and also just recently French converts to Islam, and there'll be a discussion on Islamophobia and some comedy later on today. So we have a packed day. Regarding our very interesting and intellectually stimulating program for today, we'll be traveling around the world to discover what literary gems our ancestors have left us in the distant past and also in the in recent past. So we'll kick off with our special guest, Professor Jess Edwards, followed by Gulsin Bullock, Miriam Francois, uh, Munira al Sousa, and then Muniza Hashmi. They will give us a brief biography on famous Muslim writers and poets of the past. They will have about 10 minutes each. So, uh, Professor J Jess Edwards, just a little intro into you before you start. He's Professor of uh, Place Writing and Head of English Department at Manchester Metropolitan University, or MMU here in Manchester. His published research focuses on the relationship between writing and place from a book on writing about early colonial America to recent work on poetry and the multilingual city. Professor Jess Edwards, please take the stage. Thank you very much, Asad. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this MacFest event on famous Muslim writers. So uh, I missed the very first MacFest, uh, but when I heard about it, uh, I was very excited. I got in touch with Kezra, who already had some connections with, with my university, um, and asked if I could be involved in future. And she humoured me, so I'm back again after really enjoying being there with you at the Muslim Heritage Centre last year, where I learned so much and enjoyed so much uh, great hospitality and company. Um, an amazing, uh, diverse range of, of, of uh, content in this festival. It's a wonderful thing. So as the introduction said, I'm interested as a literary researcher in the relationship between writing and place, how writers write about place and how our own relationship with place, where, whoever we are and wherever we are, can be deeply interested by the way it's written about. And these interests have taken me on a long journey over maybe 25 years as a, as a researcher. The journey began with a PhD where I studied the discovery and in some cases the rediscovery of the mathematical arts of navigation and cartography in the 16th and 17th centuries and explored their relationship with literary representations of, of newly discovered worlds. And I think I, I, I remember uh, I have a, a, a contemporary, uh, someone called uh, Jerry Broughton, who's a a professor at Queen, Queen Mary University of London. And at the time when I was studying the, these things, Jerry was beginning to study things like carpets and the transactions between East and West. Uh, and we, we had such exciting conversations about, you know, the incredibly dynamic uh, uh, interactions between the Christian and Muslim worlds in that period. Um, and this journey uh, that I've been on uh, has brought me to the present day where I've become interested in the ways in which writing can be a way for young people to explore their identities and their experiences of living in our contemporary cities through poetry, for instance. The relationships, as I've already said, between different cultures and the exchanges of knowledge between those cultures has always been at the heart of my interests. We're going to hear something to, today about the, the depth of indebtedness of European science and philosophy to Muslim uh, scholarship, something I came across repeatedly in my studies of mathematics in the early modern period. Over the past three years, I've been involved with colleagues from the City Council and University of Manchester, and I think you've already heard in the festival from uh, my friend John McAuliffe, in establishing Manchester as a UNESCO City of Literature. From the outset, our bid to win this designation for Manchester was about celebrating and promoting the astoundingly rich treasure, treasure chest of literary cultures represented in our city. This is in the first place uh, a journey of discovery for me and for everyone involved. 
Uh, and I think, you know, I think we we uh, we we know we we often bandy around that figure of almost 200 languages being spoken in our city, and of course the cultures that speak those languages. No one can know about everything, so we are all on a journey of discovery. I think I spoke last year uh, when I introduced this session about my experience of co-hosting a Mashaira at my university shortly after we gained the UNESCO designation, and what a mind expanding experience that was. I will never think about poetry in the same way again. I know that in founding MacFest, Kesra has been motivated by very similar aims to the City of Literature organization. The desire to open the treasure chest of cultures and to promote appreciation and understanding, which is why I'm delighted to be a friend and supporter of the festival. And I hope she'll let me come back in the future. Um, I should also mention before I finish um, that Manchester Met is opening this year and were it, were, were it not for coronavirus, we would have opened already a, a new poetry library. So this will be a public library uh, open to everybody in the city and, and beyond. There are only three already in the whole country uh, libraries that are dedicated just to poetry. What we want to be really distinctive about our poetry is that it represents poetry of as many of the cultures uh, that live in our city as we can. So as I say, you know, nobody can be an expert in all of that. So we are reaching out to people all the time um, to help to help us uh, curate collections, um, starting with some of the major languages, uh, of course, Urdu, um, and then moving beyond that that have spoken in our city. So coming to a session like this is another opportunity for me to learn more about literature and poetry uh, and I'm grateful to be here. So thanks Kesra for inviting me again and I'll now hand back to Assad and the panel. Thank you very much uh, Professor Jess Edwards for that interesting introduction. Now let me introduce our first biographer Gulsin Bullock from Turkey. She's a singer, musician, a creative producer and a psychotherapist, concentrating mainly on ethnic minorities. She'll be telling us about Yunus Emre, who's also known as Derwesh Yunus or Yunus the Dervish, uh, who lived uh, from 1238 to 1328 and was a uh, Turkish folk poet and Sufi mystic who greatly influenced Turkish culture. In fact, there is actually a series about him on Netflix, and I've gone through some of it. So Gulsin, please take the stage. Thank you so much, Asad. Um, is it possible to have my presentation on screen? Yeah. Yes, you should be able to see that by just clicking the view in the top right hand corner, you should just be able to see view and gallery, you should be able to then see your presentation. Sorry, I can't, is it? Um... That's okay, just the top top right hand corner, you've got a, a, a view button, you right click on view and then just go down to gallery, you should just be able to see the slide there. One second. Ah, oh, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, salam, greetings and blessings to everyone who is here with us at the moment and all the others who will be watching once it's online. It's a great honor for me to be here with you all, and I'd like to thank MacFest team, uh, Dios Kezra, for their amazing work, and uh, to our audience today who are with us, and uh, for, for the great interest they showed to MacFest and to our event today. So today I'll be talking about Yunus Emre. Um, when Kezra asked me if I would like to introduce a, a famous a Muslim poet from Turkey, I said yes straight away because I thought of Yunus Emre as UNESCO included 700th anniversary of the passing of Yunus Emre in the agenda of anniversaries to be commemorated in last year and this year. So it's a great opportunity for us to get to know him um, this year more and more and remember Yunus Emre and his amazing work. He left behind a collection of 415 uh, poems set in northwestern Anatolia as Divan Yunus Emre, and it's published in English in 1972. 
And I wanted to open with this uh, line, which is quite famous from Yunus Emre. We love the created beings because of the creator, which is quite deep. May I have my next slide, please? Thank you. So Yunus Emre, also known as Darvish Yunus, was a Darvish who lived in the era from 1238 to 1320. He was a Turkish folk poet and Sufi mystic. His name Yunus is similar to the English name Yona, and his writings are in the old Anatolian Turkish language, which is a precursor of modern Turkish. You have the slide, please. Uh, we can't see it. Can you see the slide? No. Uh, Stephen? Uh, Kesri, if you, if you just change your view to gallery, you should be able to see this. Okay. So he's one of the greatest poets of the Turkish folk literature who managed to turn the Anatolian dialect into a language of literature, who succeeded in reciting poetry and chanting hymns in pure Turkish. There's little can be said for certain of his life other than he was a Sufi dervish of Anatolia. The love people have for his poetry, liberating poetry, is echoed in the fact that some villages claim to be his birthplace and many others claim to hold his tomb in Turkey, such as Sakarya region, Karaman, Eskishehir and Nevşehir. Emre uh, lived in 13th century Anatolia during the Mongol invasions, when the rule of the Seljuk Turks had been seriously weakened, first by the attacks of the Crusades from the west, and then through the wars with the Mongols from the east. It was a time of social unrest with riots, uh, instability, and political quarrels among sultans. As we can see in the lives of many philosophers and artists, such turmoil in society often forges remarkable characters. In Emre's case, he tried to establish peace and unity in Anatolia with his humanistic ideas and efforts. In pursuit of this, he traveled extensively among all of the uh, all the local, local rulers, explaining the significance of unity and peace to them. And his great service was to give voice to and stimulate an awareness of these ideals in Anatolia. And in his poetry, he expresses a deep mysticism, humanism, and love for God. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, well, um, this year uh, and, and last year and this year has been one of the years that Yunus Emre will be commemorated by UNESCO and certain activities in Turkey and maybe around the world as well. But 1991 was also um, May, it was declared as the International Yunus Emre Year by UNESCO. And because uh, due to its being its 750th anniversary of Yunus's birth. Yunus Semre has exercised immense influence on Turkish literature from his own day until present, because uh, following Ahmed Yesevi and Sultan Walat, one of the first appreciated poets, he is one of the first appreciated poets to have written works in spoken Turkish of his era uh, and area rather than in Persian or Arabic, which was quite popular at that time. His style is very resembling the popular language of the people in central and western Anatolia, and he wrote poems depicting his love for Allah and about Sufism. Uh, his use of accessible dialect of the Turkish language is one of the most important aspects of his poetry. Previously, few poets wrote in, this, in the dialect that common people could speak or understand. And the poetry became groundbreaking because he could convey, convey the Sufi ideas to a broad audience, whether they were literate or non-literate. Non Next slide, please. Though legend obscures the facts of his life, he is known to have been a Sufi um, who sat for 40 years at the feet of his master, Taptu Kemre. Uh, it is said that during a famine, uh, Yunus traveled to one of the Sufi schools in Anatolia. It was the lodge of Hajibektash Veli, 
the founder of Bektashi Sufi order, who was a famous uh, Sufi, Sufi master and was believed to bring miraculous solutions to problems. Yunus Emre asked him if he could uh, give him some grain for his people and Haji Bektash asked him back whether he wanted to have the grain sacks or nefes, which is uh, the, sec the secret uh, breath of blessing and wisdom. After asking him for the third time, Yunus still chose the grains. And on his way back, he realized he had a mistake, he made a mistake, and he should have chosen nefes instead of grains. He went back to Haji Bektash and asked him if he could give the grains back and take his nefes instead. Haji Bektash said it was too late and his nefes was now in the hands of Taptu Kemre. So this is how he found his master, Taptu Kemre, and stayed with him and as his pupil for 40 years and after 40 years he started to write poems and hymns and traveled across Anatolia. Uh, 40 years men mentioned in the stories also has a symbolic meaning referring to the effort of one uh, who wants to reach wisdom and it's not only studying knowledge in books but uh, also the effort to know oneself which Yunus Emre describes so beautifully in, in the following poem. Knowledge should mean full grasp of, of language. Sorry, full grasp of knowledge. Knowledge means to know yourself, heart and soul. If you fail to understand yourself, then all of your reading has missed its call. Next slide, please. Yeah, there's another famous line here. The world is my true ration, its people are my nation. And in this part, I will talk about Yunus Emre's humanism. It wasn't only a humanism of peace and brotherhood, but also calls for social justice, charity, and many other familiar ideals of today's world. For example, Yunus Emre calls for helping other people and sharing one's possessions with them. If you have seen an unfortunate one and given him an old piece of clothing, tomorrow he will meet you as if he had put on a heavenly robe. The tradition of Turkish humanism is best represented by Yunus Emre. His poetry embodies the essence of Turkish Anatolian Islamic humanism, and, his, and he has served as a service of the humanistic concepts which influenced the intellectual life of the Turks on later centuries. Much of his work talks about equality of all men. He expresses this idea in the following couplet in metaphoric way. Water out of the same fountain cannot be both bitter and sweet. Yunus Emre decried religious tolerance and dwelt on the unity of humanity. We regard no one's religion as contrary to ours. True love is born when 11 faiths are united as a whole. That's another line from him, which is quite beautiful. Next slide, please. This is obviously, um, some of you may know, on Netflix, there is a series on Yunus Emre. If you wanted to know more about him and his poetry or the time that he lived, you could watch this TV series. It's been broadcasted in Turkey in 2015 and 16, and, and it's become a popular uh, TV series, Netflix series at the moment. Obviously, this means that Yunus Emre, unlike Rumi, is virtually unknown outside of Turkey is coming to the attention of international audience for the first time. So that's an option. Can I have my next slide, please? Thank you so much. Um, you can see his uh, statue in Nefshir uh, on the left. And um, as, as uh, we said, Yunus Semre has exercised immense influence on Turkish literature from his own day until the present. His diction remains very close to the popular speech of the people in Central and Western Anatolia. This is also the language of a number of anonymous folk poets, folk songs, fairy tales, riddles, and proverbs. So I would like to read this line from him, uh, this, this poem from him, which is actually the end um, a verse of a, a poem which is quite longer than that and is being uh, composed as a song as well. And I would love to end my presentation with singing a Turkish version to you. But first, let me 
say the English translation. Eunice is my name. Each passing day fans and roses my flame. What I desire in both worlds is the same. You are the one I need. You are the one I crave. Yunus durur benim adım gün geçtikçe artar odum iki cihan damak sudum bana seni gerek seni iki cihan damak sudum bana seni gerek seni thank you for listening thank you very much indeed gosin uh, that was uh, extremely interesting and uh, i think we can have a session on just your singing uh, on one of these uh, sessions perhaps uh, right let me just uh, put my video on again right okay so now we move uh, and of course i will certainly be finishing the uh, the series on netflix which i started uh, a while back uh, and i do find turkish dramas extremely interesting having just gone through five seasons of ertuğrul i'm going through payetat uh, at the moment so we now move on to um miriam francois who in 2003 at the age of 21 converted to Islam, but understandably after 18 years as a Muslim, does not like being referred to as a convert. She has had a very interesting career as well. Uh, in the early years, she was an actress, then became an academic and journalist after graduating from Oxbridge. So Miriam will be telling us about the life and works of the writer Charles Legay Eaton, also known as Hassan Abdul Hakim, who lived from 1921 to 2010. And he was a British diplomat, writer, and Islamic scholar. Miriam, please take the stage. Hi, Assalamualaikum. And just to correct that, it's uh, 16 years, not 18 years. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to those two extra years. But thank you for that introduction. Um, and Gilson, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Um, I particularly uh, enjoyed hearing. Um, the poem in Turkish personally. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to talk to everyone today about Charles Agai Eaton, otherwise known as Hassan Lagai or Hassan Abdul Hakim. If I can get my presentation up, which I think I can. Um, so gallery, right guys? Hit gallery? Yeah, hit gallery. You should just be able to see that there. Okay. Uh, so when I hit gallery, I can see the presentation. Hopefully you all can as well. Can ya? yeah that's correct you can see the presentation fantastic okay thank you so much so um now you know who i'm talking about we can probably move on to the next slide you've got a got a sense of who uh, the man is so why did i want to talk about charles um uh, legay eaton well uh, first and foremost because he is someone after my own heart um he was born of british parents uh, but he was born abroad in switzerland he grew up there um he kind of didn't really identify with any particular location in the world he felt like he was a um rootless in many ways um, and in his teenage years he was someone who became very interested in philosophy but at the same time like myself um, frustrated with some of the limitations, I guess, of the philosophical um, answers that he was reading. And he decided um, after university to head out uh, to Egypt, where he encountered uh, some of the greats, actually, René Guénon, if you know the uh, French uh, writer, uh, I guess you could say philosopher, and who also became a Muslim. Um, he encountered Martin Lings, who wrote the uh, seminal uh, biography of the Prophet Sallallahu um, and really um, had discovered, uh, discovered, I suppose, Islam in practice. Having said that, he was much like myself. Um, I of have often described myself as a, as a Muslim, but, um, despite myself, which was that he got to know Islam theoretically, but was struggling to uh, kind of connect the, the theory to the practice. And this is a man who had developed a very um, 
profound interest in Eastern religions uh, more broadly. So Islam wasn't his only form of interest. And in fact, his um, approach when he eventually did convert um, or uh, decide to become a, a Muslim, which was um, when he was in his 20s in Egypt, um, was uh, he really subscribed to what, what is known as the school of perennialism, perennialism in Islam. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with it. So I thought I'd read you a little excerpt from uh, one of his books, one of my favorites called King of the Castle, where he talks about um, that particular approach. So he says, and I, this is his, his words from now on, the point of view from which this book is written is in the first place, Islamic. This does not mean that Muslims in general would necessarily endorse the views expressed or that I propose to put forward a specifically Islamic critique of Western post-Christian civilization. What it does mean is that this view is rooted in the Muslim faith and in a soil quite different to that which supports either the modernistic Christian or the modern atheist. Secondly, this perspective is founded upon a belief in the essential unity of the great religions as deriving from a single source of revelation and in perennial wisdom expressed not only through the religions, but also in the myths and symbols of ancient peoples and of what are commonly called primitive human groups up to the present day. A wisdom which, we, which may be said to inher in the deepest level of our being, so that we need only to be reminded of it in order to rediscover the truths within ourselves. This belief is in fact an extension of the Islamic perspective, for Islam is by definition the final revelation in this human cycle and the final crystallization of that wisdom. So perennialism for all who are interested, um, the authors that you can look up if you're interested in that school of thought, of course, uh, Guy Eaton, Martin Lings, Fritjof Schuon would be another one. Um, so I would have, uh, really recommend uh, looking up their works. Now, again, Charles Eaton for me was somebody whose uh, journey not only encapsulated this idea that actually Islam is what is part of um, a series of uh, revelations and wisdoms uh, that were sent by God to guide humankind and, and provide us with um, a, a framework for actualizing the highest possibilities of the of the human self. Um, but he was also very human. And I think that's one of the aspects of him that I loved he, when he wrote uh, The Richest Vein, which was, I think, his, his first book, The Richest Vein, uh, which is kind of a survey of Eastern religions. Um, he, um, when the book was published, he traveled to Jamaica, which was a country that he had a, a lifelong love for and ended up marrying, um, in fact, a Jamaican uh, lady, a uh, Jamaican artist. And um, in, when he um, arrived in uh, Jamaica, the book, The Richest Vein, has started to become quite popular. Um, and a lot of people very interested in spirituality uh, were suddenly taking an interest in this, this guy called Guy Eaton. And so much so that there was one pr uh, priest who actually traveled all the way to Jamaica looking for this grand mystic, thinking that he was gonna find some old white man with a beard and you know long hair and, and legend has it that he uh, turned up to a house party in Jamaica and found uh, Guy Eaton with um, you know not sober and uh, a woman on each leg. Um, and and so there, there you have it within within his own life, kind of the contradictions and the in the lives of the believer, whereby the theoretical wasn't and isn't always manifested uh, as concretely uh, or as consistently. Um, and so that for him was the beginning of him trying to reconcile, I think, those aspects of his lives. Um, and so he talks about that. He talks about sort of knowing Islam theoretically from his time in Egypt all the way through to kind of understanding it at such a profound level that he could convey these truths in his mm -hmm. writing, but was still um, uh, drawn in by the dunya, as we would say it. Um, I wanted to read you a little passage so you get a sense of his critiques of the modern world, because I think the reason I really wanted to um, present him today is because I feel that there's still so much about his writings that offer a really incisive critique of uh, some of the problems that we're facing um, in, in, in the West, in, in Europe and, and in Britain today. So this is just a, a short section. He says, in a highly competitive society, trivial ambitions force us to devote all that we have in us to give and more than we have any right to give to entirely local and profane tasks. A man cannot serve two masters. Our energies are limited and our time is short. 
which is why they have to be contained and directed and why the human communities of earlier times were concerned that the tasks of the practical life should reflect and even embody the spiritual or ritual work through which we make our way towards the central place. Um, so I just, I, I really um, particularly adore the idea that uh, the struggle that we face in our current societies is this um, kind of capitalist driven a drive for accumulation, profit, um, uh, more and more, um, and that actually we know that this has led to um, harm to pe you know humans, to animals, to the planet, um, and that actually um, this infernal train that we're on, which is headed for um, you know without getting too doomsday about it, but but for not not a happy ending, um, is in fact. Um, a completely misguided direction and that we have um, access to forms of wisdom, sources of, um, sources of knowledge that can direct us towards an alternative way of existing within the world. And that's what one of my favorite books and the one that I've actually been citing today that he wrote called King of the Castle. Um, thank you for putting up the other books. Yeah, King of the Castle is really, um, I, I would say like an urgent call to not just Muslims, and I think this is the beauty of a lot of um, Gaim's work, is that he doesn't just talk to Muslims. What he says in the books are rooted in Islamic wisdom, but there are books that are urgently saying we are headed in the wrong direction. The framework of values that is guiding human behavior today um, is, um, is, is leading us in the wrong direction. So I got distracted by some comments. I'll try and have a look at them before I lock off. Um, so, um, so Gaetan continues, he eventually becomes a, a British uh, diplomat. Uh, for those of you who are interested in his works, um, I myself can say that I read um, his, he ended up writing a, a biography, an autobiography, uh, in fact, uh, called A Bad Beginning, um, very shortly, in fact, before he died, which I thought was really interesting because if you read Gaetan's work before you read his autobiography, you will have such a different perception of the man himself and for a long time as a Muslim I think I struggled um, to reconcile the two you know I almost felt a little begrudging I was like what what is this guy who's out in Jamaica having um, you know having this dunya life and at the same time is writing these profound um, kind of uh, books that, that are some of the most insightful I've read uh, around Islam um, and it's only with time and uh, really more understanding of the self that I think that you, you come to understand um, the struggle that he went through much better. And in fact, I'm grateful to him for his honesty, which stands in contrast, I think, to a lot of the uh, kind of facades that are put up uh, in our community of um, uh, Im immaculateness. So I'll read you a last part before I lock off, if I may, um, because this part really is to me a symbolic of the call that he's making in his work for um, people who are carriers of that wisdom to push for us to renew with a different set of values so that we can not just be you know happier more productive humans but actually live in more symbiosis, not only with one another, but ultimately with the planet, the, um, the finite planet that we have been tasked um, as, as vicesurgents of. Um, and this idea that we have uh, a responsibility as Muslims to maintain um, the balance, the equilibrium um, that exists all around us and which actually at the moment, we are quite happy to um, destroy um, entirely uh, as long as we can um, keep up with our material goods. So here we go, this is, these are his words. Meanwhile, the supposed masters of this world, the leaders who have fought their way to the top of the human pile and must fight without respite to stay on top are too enmeshed in the processes now at work to look up for a moment from their 18 hour day labors and see where they are going. Responding as best they can to crisis upon crisis following upon crisis and faced with logistic and administrative problems which are becoming increasingly unmanageable, they cannot afford to cultivate the lover's eye or the vision of the God-centered man. They are no less competent than the average man in the street whom they officially represent, 
but the demands made upon their time and energy would incapaci incapacitate better men than these and effectively prevent them from giving serious thought to any issue. Yet it is not necessity which makes these demands. They are gal galvanized into ceaseless activity by a fever for change which is self-generating and serves no purpose. More and more laws are made for the sake of lawmaking and more and more interference in every aspect of human life prevents anything from functioning in accordance with its own nature. Solid buildings are pulled down so that shoddy ones may be put up and everything is out of date by the time it is ready for use. In the grip of this fever and seized by the momentum of the world's descending course, they pull their carts as blinkered horses, seeing nothing but the small stretch of road immediately ahead. To stop now, even to pause for breath, would bring the turning wheels to a halt. To attempt to reverse the process or to check its gathering momentum would be to destroy the modern world as we know it. So the process continues and its momentum increases. Anyone who could fling himself out of the vehicle and in some last sanctuary stand still at the center of the world might expect to hear a huge din of overheated metal fading into the distance in the direction of nothingness, a juggernaut with its great load of human souls. And still, in the midst of unprecedented change, flurry and pandemonium, the human situation remains what it always was. Man is still either viceroy or usurper, still noble when he achieves forms of, when he achieves beauty of form, both within himself and in his environment, and still able to look upon Leila with the eyes of Mejnun, and the truth is what it has always been, accessible in varying degrees to those who focus their attention, their love and their deepest hunger in the right direction. Thank you so much. I hope that that will inspire some of you to look up the work of Guy Eaton. He is really a giant of uh, the British uh, Muslim tradition. He's somebody who I believe offers us a root of renewal um, critiques of the modern world which are more needed now than ever uh, and I would hope that from what you've heard in even in that small excerpt uh, many passages that are in, in fact highly relevant to the situation we find ourselves in today so thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much indeed Miriam Francois for giving us a window into the life and mind of Charles Legay Eaton. Thank you very much indeed. We will now move on to uh, Munira Al Susa. Uh, she's a head teacher of Manchester Arabic School in Chorlton. Munira is a graduate of Liverpool University and has a personal interest in MacFest due to her desire for maintaining the culture and identity of ethnic minorities and is of Palestinian origin. She'll be telling us about the writer and, of course, scientist Abu Walid Muhammad Ibn Ahmed Ibn Rushd, otherwise mostly known as Ibn Rushd, who lived from 1126 to 1198. His uh, Latinized name is Abaroes and was a Spanish Muslim. Ibn Rushd was a polymath and jurist who wrote more than a hundred books. So Munira, please take the stage. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everyone on the last Sunday of the first month of 2021. So it's a brilliant way to, to end this month um, of the, this year. I would like to say a big thank you to MacFest for having me on this event and a big thank you for Sister Kisra for all her efforts uh, in delivering this marvelous and ever uh, brilliant uh, event, MacFest. It's an excellent way for us uh, as the Muslims to recover some of our history and to make our those new generation to be more aware of the great history and hopefully inshallah one day they're going to be inspired by those great writers as, as i said i'll be talking about Ibn rushed and i will start sharing my screen with you i hope you can able you'll be able to see it yeah we can see it is it there yes brilliant thank you well because i'm a teacher i thought the best way and the quickest way is to go for the WH words. So I thought I'm gonna put these and then I will go through them to go through the life of Ibn Rushd. Uh, Ibn Rushd, who is he? As, the, as Asad mentioned, he's uh, Abdul Walid Muhammad Ibn Hamid Ibn Muhammad Ibn Rushd. He's an Arabian philosopher, astronomer, and he wrote on 
Jordis Perdunis. Uh, Avarice, as uh, known for lots of people, he uh, was the Latin name of uh, Ibn Rushd. Avarice is the medieval Latin from Ibn Rushd, and it was deri derived from the Spanish pronunciation of the original Arabic word Ibn, the son of Ibn. So it became like Ibn, and eventually by the time it became Ever Ibn and then Everest. So this, this is where his name Everest is derived from. So originally it's it has uh, originated from the Arabic word Ibn, so it's not that far really. So this is his full name. When he was born on the 14th of April, it's the same month that I was born in. I was born on the 28th, I'm not saying the year though. <laughs> so he was born in April, uh, uh, 1126, and he died on the 10th of December, 11, uh, well, 1198. So in, in this April 21, 2021, he would have been, uh, well, alive in history, I would say, 823 years. And thank you, Maxist, for, uh, for after those 823 to bring him back and to make people, students, children, people at home, virtually to learn about every rush. It's a fantastic event. Thank you again. So he, he died at the age of 72. Uh, why, where was he born? He was born in Spain, in Cordova. In Arabic, it's Cordova. Until now, there's a lot of, as we'll see later on in this PowerPoint, there's, there, there was a lot of um, things made in Cordova to remember Ibn Rushd, because he wasn't just any scientist. He wasn't just any philosopher. He was extra special. And that's why he was mentioned in so many books and so many uh, artistic things, I would say. We'll leave that for the, uh, later in the event. So as I said before, he died in December, he died uh, on the 10th of December at the age of 72, and he died in Marrakesh, where he was buried. And this is an interesting point. After he was buried in Marrakesh, three months later, his body was moved to Cordoba, his birthplace. I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he, hadn't, if he hasn't asked for that, because usually, uh, I don't know, uh, is it a Muslim thing? Is it an Arab thing? Usually they like to be buried back where they were born in their, in their birthplace. So he was taken from Marrakesh in Morocco back to Cordoba in Spain. His works remain important, uh, an important influence on the future uh, of the great thinkers and, create, uh, and create creative minds. Uh, because I, I was told to do this uh, PowerPoint about uh, a presentation about Ibn Rushd, um, it was a great chance to see, and I was really, really surprised to see how many, how many people, how many scientists, writers, philosophers have searched and wrote about Ibn Rushd. It, it, and I'm going to say something, maybe I would be a bit embarrassed as an Arab, as an Arab that uh, more, uh, more, I would say, European uh, writings and um, uh, research has been done uh, about the life of Ibn, Ibn Rushd, about his work, more than the Arab style. I was a bit uh, surprised, to be honest. So yeah, there was a lot, a lot of work, a lot of researches that have been done about Ibn Rushd and about his books and about the work that he gave to the world. So Ibn Rushd, uh, Ibn Rushd, uh, it, it, he wrote about so many, as a we mentioned earlier he was a philosopher. He was an astronomer. He he wrote uh, about so many, about so many uh, topics and about so many uh, subjects. So he uh, wrote more than twenty thousand pages. Um, sorry, just remove this. He wrote about um, twenty thousand pages covering a wide range of diverse subjects. So he wrote about Islamic philosophy about Arabic medicine, he's a doctor, he's a philosopher, about logic in the Islamic philosophy, about Arabic astronomy, mathematics, and theology, even about Arabic grammar, as well as Sharia law, which is the Islamic law, fiqh, and Islamic jurisprudence. Everest's most significant, significant works dealt with Islamic philosophy. So he mainly, he was a scientist and he was a philosopher. And for these two things to be uh, to, to, to be related, I think is the top 
of, of everything because you are a believer in God. And it's not just because you believe theory, in theory, but because you're a scientist, you're a doctor, you see that with your own eyes. And then you find for yourself from, from your word day by day that there must be a creator for all what you've seen as a, as a scientist, a doctor, astronomer, or even a philosopher. So, so he dealt with Islamic philosophy, medicine, and fiqh. It's just a combination of medicine and fiqh, to be honest. It just make you stop and think. Um, he wrote around 67 original works, which included 28 research on philosophy, 20 uh, research on medicine, five research on theology, on law, eight on law, four on grammar. In, all, uh, in addition to all these, he did a lot of writing and a lot of, um, well, a lot of research uh, on the work of Aristotle and Plato's, which is the known the Republic. So they were living more or less in the same period of time. And then he shared a lot of their ideas and there was a lot between them, uh, especially on philosophy and um, philosophy and logic. So the, if you're interested, you can, there's a lot of researches that have been done. Uh, you're talking about Ibn Rudd and his relationship with Aristotle and uh, about the things they wrote and about their ideas and how they're comparing and contrasting their point of view about different subjects. So it's very, very interesting, interesting for those who are, uh, who would like to know more about this. Moving on. Um, so why, why Ibn Rushd is important? Why is he still remembered to the day after 823 years? He is, as I said, he's the foremost Islamic philosopher and he stands out as a towering figure in the history of Arab Islamic thought, as well as the West European philosophy and theology. So this is why he is equally important to the uh, Muslims and to the European. A common theme throughout his writing is that there is no incompatibility between religion and philosophy when both are properly understood. I think this is this is the, the key message. And we all, I, I, I don't know, I've got when I've read it, it's, we still apply it to today. His contributions to philosophy took many forms, ranging from his detailed sentimentaries on Aristotle. In the Western world, he was recognized as early as the 13th century as the commentator of Aristotle, contributing thereby to his rediscovery of the master after centuries of near total oblivion in the, in the Western Europe. The discovery was instrumental in launching Latin scholasticism, and in due course, the European Renaissance of the 15th century so uh, as I said, this is related to the previous uh, slide. Aristotle, if you are more interested to read about the, the contribution of Ibn Rushd and his thoughts, the thoughts that were related to the European philosophy, I would say it's worth reading about it. It's, it's very interesting, especially for, for nowadays, for present. Uh, where was I? Yeah, there has been a little mention of uh, to Ibn Rushd's work in English. There has been very not, I don't think at the moment, there's a lot that been uh, talked about uh, Ibn Rushd in English. Uh, at that time, he, he wasn't mentioned a lot, but later on, when people started to read his work and to learn more about his work and to translate it, that's where Europe started to get more interested into Ibn Rushd's work and to translate it again and to use the knowledge and the information that he put in, in those uh, in those researches and those books. So uh, there was a great interest shown in France. So France, uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of his book translated into French and even they have this, uh, this in, that has been translated into French, even a, a full name uh, after Ibn Rush Everest. So that was his, the, the importance of Ibn Rush for Europe and as I said, the French were one of the first people to get real interested in Ibn Rushd's books and writings and to translate it into, um, into French. And if you go, again, if you're interested to learn, to learn more about Ibn Rushd, there was, when I was searching, there were a lot of uh, videos, a lot of lectures in French and in English. 
by really um, uh, well, well known philosophers and they talk about him for, for hours. So it was really, really interesting to learn more about him and to see how he is well respected uh, in, the, in Europe. It was really interesting videos to watch. Uh, moving on, um, Eben Rushd, uh, Eben Rushd work, a careful examination of his works reveal. So this is one of his, uh, the, the, one of the main characteristics of Eben Rushd. He was deeply an Islamic man, as an example, when we find in his writing. And I had a couple of quotation at the words the end to prove that he was an Islamic, an Islamic man. But at the same time, this is, what is interesting about him? Islam plus science, Islam plus philosophy, Islam plus uh, astronomy, plus maths. He was amazing. So there is no contradiction whatsoever between being a good Muslim or being to, 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 to have your own beliefs and at the same time being creative and intelligent, just like a person like Ibn Rushd. So anyone who studies anatomy will increase his faith in the omnipotence and the oneness of God, the Almighty. I, 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 I don't know, but this sentence, to be honest, it summarizes, uh, it, it, it has been mentioned in the Quran and only those scientists and only those who look deeper into Allah's creations will only realize the, the, power, the powerfulness and the greatness of Allah's creation. And that will make them not arrogant, not a show off, but that will make them even a strong, a stronger believers in Allah's creation and in Allah's uh, oneness. So uh, I was really, really impressed and I was touched by uh, his words and his writings. And as I said, I think such words and such uh, thoughts of Ibn Rushd, of Ibn Rushd at, at, those, at those times especially, I think it was just like a healer, and it's um, it's just make you think how a great person that lived more than eight hundred years can still, with those words and his belief, can help you to understand life better and to make you feel stronger about your belief and about your point of view about so many things. Uh, unfortunately. Thank you because of the time I have to move on. Uh, uh, your time, you've got one minute, please. Oh, sorry, time. sorry about this. Yeah, one minute. <laughs> so these are some of his quotes. Uh, Two truths cannot contradict one another. And ignorance leads to fear, fear leads to hatred, and hatred leads to violence. This is the equation, all of these ones. And one final one. Uh, to Everest, the world, including the sun, the moon, the rivers, the seas, and the location of humans, seems to be tuned to support human life and indicates the existence of the creator. Wonderful uh, quotation. And finally, when I said about Kutuba, he was remembered as a statue in Kutuba, a beautiful place. I'm sure lots of people went there. I'm hoping that one day I will go there. He was remembered as a stamp, again, so he was put, uh, published on a stamp to use. And he was remembered as a film, it's called Le Dustun, again in French, uh, Al Masir in Arabic. So uh, because of his work and his importance uh, on, on different subjects, different topics, he was remembered. And I think MacFest today, we should add MacFest to this. He was remembered by MacFest. And thank you very much, MacFest. Thank you very much, Kisra, for remembering Ibn Rushd and bringing him back from history. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Munira, Jazakallah Khair, uh, for giving us an insight into this intellectual giant of the Middle Ages. And I'll add a little footnote at the end regarding this matter. Thank so you. we come now to the, uh, the final of our presentations. Uh, we have Muniza Hashmi. She's a broadcaster, television producer, and a former general manager of the Pakistan Television Corporation, PTV. Moniza has a master's degree in education from the University of Hawaii, US. She's also the youngest daughter of the prominent Pakistani poet, Faiz Ahmed Faiz. And indeed, she will be giving us a, uh, a taste of his, her father's poetry. Yes, it is the daughter talking about her father,
Faiz Ahmed Faiz. You have 20 minutes, Maniza, please take the stage. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. Bismillah um, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the gracious, peace be upon all of you. Um, I'm not sure whether to say good evening, good afternoon, whatever, because in Pakistan, it is now way past 6.30 in the evening. Thank you so much, MacFest. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for giving the opportunity to listen to such fantastic uh, uh, discourses that I have just heard. I am fortunate now to be presenting a small, uh, shall I say, um, just a kind of a summary of my father and I'll try and make it as, uh, as interesting as I can because as a daughter, you do sometimes tend to overlook maybe uh, a lot of small things, big things, whatever, but anyway. Um, I would like the first slide to go up, please, if it's not already up, because I'm not very computer savvy here, but I'm sure it is, uh, so that you can see his photograph or his image that you can see. I have it here on my phone, so I'm following it as we go along. Um, I would like to talk about him, not as a father, obviously, at this time, but as the poet of the century. And he is, uh, from what I understand, can you just please change to the next slide? Which should say, as I said, I can't see it, but I am going to trust Steve on this. Um, yes, I have it here on my phone. So Faz Ahmed Faz, he was born on the 13th of February, 1911, the month coming up, we are going to be celebrating his 110th birthday in the Sialkot district of Punjab, which is also, I may add, the district of the city where the uh, poet of the East, as we call him, Lama Iqbal, the poet who gave the first idea, the first thought of Pakistan uh, was also born and Fez is, was, remains to be, and the son of the soil as we call him, but also the fact that he was a, a great follower, fan, um, disciple of the great Iqbal, and um, Iqbal was, of course, for us, all of us, an extremely, extremely prestigious person. And Fez and Iqbal to be same from Sialkot is something that we all find extremely uh, coincidental, but also absolutely how it should have been. He's a Pakistani, obviously, born an Indian at that time, obviously, 1911. But of course, he opted for Pakistan and, we, and he shifted with his family to Lahore from Delhi once the partition took place, even before. He was a Marxist, and this is something that I have say that now, because he did believe in that, and I will explain that to me as you go on, a poet and an author in Urdu. To date, we say, we believe, and I think it is a fact, that he's one of the most well-read, well-recited, well-sung poet of uh, the subcontinent, and the most well-known. And this is not only in Pakistan, but in India as well, in Bangladesh also, which as you people would know was once un until um, the recent past a part of Pakistan, there was East Pakistan, West Pakistan, Bangladesh then became uh, East Pak uh, Bangladesh. So he was, he's still very much revered there as well. He's one of the most celebrated writers of the Urdu language, which is um, his, his books. He, amazingly, this is something that I just like to mention here, considering his popularity and the fact that he is so uh, respected and so well read, he wrote very little actually. And there's just one book, I'll show you the slides later. There's just, uh, he wrote several books, but sort of, there's just one book now, which is called Nusrahai Wafa, uh, which is his, his collection. And therefore, uh, considering when you look at Iqbal, who, when you look at Ghalib, and you look at all the other great poets of that time, Faz stands along them, but having written very little. That's quite a surprising thing. He has been described as a man of wide experience, having been a teacher. He began his, uh, his career, if you want to call it, by teaching in Government College Lahore, which is one of the most prestigious universities. Uh, at this moment, it's now called Government College Lahore University. At that time, it was Government College. And uh, all the great people the great, um, I should say, the thinkers, the intellectuals, the poets, the writers, 
All of them were educated there and he was one of them as well. He also joined the British Army at the time of the war, but not as, uh, as an active officer that way, but he joined in the public relation wing and therefore he was trying to project and uh, see what was going on because don't forget the, the war was against the fascist regime. He was a journalist as well because he also became the editor of the Pakistan Times, which was the first newspaper that was formed uh, immediately after Pakistan was formed on the 14th of August, 1947. And then he was a trade unionist. He represented the trade unions. He was uh, elected to as, one, as an office bearer as well. And he was also a broadcaster in his own way. His vision, now his vision was his love for peace and his poems which had been previously translated into Russian, earned him the Lenin Peace Prize in 1963. For him and for us as well, of course, this is one of the most prestigious awards that was given to him because of his belief and because of his commitment to Marxism at the time. And he was chosen, he went to Moscow to receive the prize, to receive the, the medal. And he, he has been translated into now I can say every, uh, every uh, language of the Soviet Union. At that time, of course, it was only Russian, but now as we know, there are several languages there. He is the most widely read and most widely uh, published author in the Soviet Union from a, as a foreigner. He has been translated into so many languages across the world, which from, if you go from one side, which is Japanese and Chinese, down to Spanish. He had the fortune, good fortune, because of his um, Marxist beliefs. And um, he traveled to Cuba, he met Castro. Um, he then, he was a great traveler across to the Soviet Union, obviously. He traveled, he was a great, great admirer of Nazem Hikmat. He um, met Pablo Neruda, he was, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, if I start pointing out those names, then of course I'll finish my time. So um, can I have the next slide, please? This is a list of his books, if you can see it, I'm sure you can. And there are several names which I won't read out to you because for the non-English speakers, they may be a little difficult because they are taken from very, um, because he was, let me also say that he, he spoke um, Arabic, Persian, English and Urdu. He was fluent in these languages and he was obviously when he wrote his poetry, which was in Urdu, unlike Iqbal who also wrote it in Persian, he wrote only in Urdu, uh, he would draw metaphors and, and examples and inspirations from Persian and from Arabic. In fact, there are certain uh, poems of his which are actually people say and I'm sorry, I may be his daughter, but I'm not that educated in those languages. My language is Urdu and English. English because my mother was English. She was from London. I'll give you that story in a minute. And uh, so uh, they are direct inspirations, direct inspirations from the Quran. For example, there is this one poem and I'll just slightly deviate here and just take a few couple of minutes. There is this poem uh, I'm now speaking to maybe possibly the listeners who might be familiar with the name of Paris. And there is this one poem which has become now almost a rallying cry for the downtrodden, literally across the world. And I will just say it in Urdu so that you will understand. The title is Hum Dekhenge, We Will See. It's almost like, if you'd like to understand, like we shall overcome, if you remember. So this poem uh, in India, uh, in the past, maybe, well, let's forget last year because that's literally should be written off from the history books, but anyway, uh, almost for a couple of years, or it was August, 2019, if some of you may follow, when uh, India brought in that horrific act of Kashmir and uh, annexed, as we say, Kashmir and so on and so forth. That's when this poem rose, we shall overcome or we shall see. Hum dekhenge, lazim hai ke hum bhi dekhenge. Wo waqt ke jiska wada hai, that we shall see the time that was promised. 
And then from starting from that one, shall I say, um, uh, movement, it moved all across India. If you may recall, friends of mine who might have some interest in, the, in, in what happened, is that um, the Indian government brought in this new act in which you were supposed to um, sort of swear allegiance to in whatever, whatever. And then there were demonstrations and demos across India. And there was this huge uh, demonstration in Delhi by the women of Shaheen Bagh, where they sat in for days and they were chanting this poem, Hum Dekhenge. So, um, and then in Pakistan as well, where we have unfortunately had a lot of, um, shall we say political upheavals, one up, one down and so on and so forth, Never mind. This poem has actually come to the point of becoming the second national anthem of Pakistan. You stand anywhere and you just say, Hum Dekhenge, and surely, surely in the audience, somebody will repeat the next line. Somebody will repeat the next line. So um, that is what he became. He became somebody who was admired so much for his poetry and for his connection with the people of Pakistan. Can I have the next slide, please? This is where you'll see his books. There are just a few of them. I didn't put all of them there. But if you could concentrate on um, the right-hand side, which you see a black and white small foot picture, I mean, picture of him, that is him. And that is his book, which is called, as I said, Nuskahai Wafa. And this book came out, this is a collection of his poetry. It came out two days before he died in 1984, which was rather interesting. And it is still today, I mean, he's been dead 84. He's been dead as many years as you can calculate. And he is, this book is still selling uh, amazingly well, if I can call it that, in Pakistan. I simply say that because we get royalties, so we know. If we go to the last slide, please, Steve. Thank you so much. Themes in Faz's poetry. Now, uh, initially, Faz Sahab, I, I call him Faz Sahab. I, that's because he is, for me, someone, I can see him right up here. I'm sitting in a chair in my room and he's right in front of me. I have a portrait of him smiling at me. He's probably grinning away and thinking, what is this girl saying about me? Anyway, so um, his early poems were about love, emotion, romance, until he met, her name is Dr. Rashid Jahan. Uh, he met her in Amritsar and uh, this is obviously pre-partition and uh, her husband and they got involved or they talked to him and his vision of the world changed. And he started thinking of the people and the downtrodden and the world, which is not what it should be and how, how it is absolutely cruel and how it is absolutely worse for the treatment of the people and so on and so forth. And then his stance towards his poetry changed and then he became a poet of the people, for the people, by the people. He started writing, he went into, he didn't actually go into active politics. Please get, don't get me wrong there. He was not an active politician, but obviously uh, he always used to say that there's nobody who's apolitical. You have to have some kind of a connection. So he started writing about uh, the community and obviously the most terrible, terrible injustices that were going on. And then that is became his, um, he, it became almost his, his, his whole vision. But I would like, just like to, I'm looking at the time as well. Um, he was, you know, let me just say a couple of things about my parents, my dad, as I would like to call him. <clears throat> um, my mother, my mother was a Britisher, as I just said, and she came, she traveled to India at that time to visit her sister who had also married uh, an Indian as it was at that time who she had met in London in in Oxford and she came to visit her sister the war broke out this is 1939 the second world war so she couldn't go back and my father was a, a pupil of Dr. Tasir, who was my uncle and uh, then of course love blossomed and so on and so forth and after some problems in his house because obviously it was not easy because my mother had to convert to Islam 
for my grandmother's sake. And then they were married and uh, she was a Britisher. And uh, that union remained intact, of course, until he died earlier and she died later. My father also had a, a couple of, um, shall I say, important milestones in his life that I might want to talk about. In 1951, there was uh, supposedly, we call it the alleged, the so-called Rawalpindi conspiracy case. Rawalpindi is a small city in uh, Pakistan. That's used to be where all the government and so on sorts of things happened. <clears throat> there was a Rawalpindi so-called conspiracy case in which he was a part of listening and talking to what was happening. The conspiracy case, I suggest you go back and it's a long story, so you could check it out if you want to. The, but the, uh, the interesting thing is that after discussions, the conspiracy itself was called off. It was called off. But like things happen, the news got to the powers that be a little late and they came in and they arrested all the people, et cetera, et cetera. My father was one of them. He was on uh, death row, <laughs> yes, yes, for uh, several months. We did not know. I was, of course, a very young child at that time. But I am told and I have heard and I have read that my mother uh, being the Britisher and being the person who was, she was a great dynamic person. She fought the way through, et cetera, et cetera. But we did not hear about him, whether he was dead or alive for many months anyway. So it came to trial and then he was sentenced and they were all sentenced for five years. So my father was in jail for five years and we used to travel and so on and so forth to see him. It was a very, very difficult time. If you like, there are books available about that. There are letters that the husband and wife wrote to each other and so on and so forth. And there's also a very interesting biography which has been written by my son, which is called an authorized biography because the family uh, has asked him to write it. And it's called Love and Revolution by Dr. Ali Hashmi. You might want to read it if you want to know more about the man. And it's a very authentic book. So then there was that, then he was also committed to prison in the year 1968. Um, that was during the second. I mean, we've had a series of martial laws in this country, unfortunately. And every time the military would come in, they would throw in the progressives and the liberals. And he was on top of the list at that time. So it was that kind. Then, of course, after he got his Lenin Priest Prize in uh, 1962, 63, he was then ostracized. And everybody said, don't come back, don't come back. So then he went into exile. And I moved to, we all moved to England. We stayed there for three, four years. He came back and then came the martial law of, of, of 1977 after Bhutto was um, uh, hung and that was a problem. So he went into self-exile again and he went into self-exile for a longer time from 78, 79 to about 84 or so. He went to Beirut. He was very close. He became very close to the Palestinian cause. He was very close to Yasser Arafat. He became a member of the Afro-Asian uh, Writers' Union, and he began to um, edit the Lotus magazine, which was based in Beirut. Uh, when the Intifada happened, he had to escape in the boot of a car. Uh, he went to Tunis and so on and so forth. That's a long story. It really is quite an exciting story anyway. But he came back in 84, and I believe, I am a strong believer, I am a Muslim, alhamdulillah. I do believe that there was some sort of a uh, maybe a sign or something. So he, I, I say that he came home to die. And so he came back, he got sick and so on and so forth and his health deteriorated on the 20th of November. He died in 1984 and he's now buried in Lahore. Uh, in his memory, we hold a Faz festival every year, which is a huge festival in November. Of course, last year we couldn't have it. It draws thousands and thousands of people from across Pakistan. It is a rallying place for workers, for trade unionists, for uh, Marxists, they come and it's, it's, it's a three day festival of great joy, great music, but much thought, much conversation, much discussion, uh, um, dancing music, because Fez's is, is poetry is well read and well sung by all the leading artists of our subcontinent and so on and so forth. And I know I'm running out of time. In fact, I have run out of time. And I will take your permission, Asad, if I may, to just read out one poem, uh, a short poem, 
and then a translation no for problem. anyone who would like to read it to understand. It's called, I will read it in Urdu first and then the English translation. <laughs> it's called Loho Kalam. This is about writing, about his writing. Kalam means pen and law means the desire to write. Let me read it to you in Urdu and then I will read it to you, the translation. Ham parvarishe loho kalam karte rahenge jo dil pe guzarti hai rakam karte rahenge asbabe game ishq baham karte rahenge virani e dora pe karam karte rahenge ha talhi e ayam abi or badhegi ha ehle sitam mashke sitam karte rahenge. The translation is by Victor Kiernan, one of his dearest friends who lived in Scotland, but who came to visit and it's one of the best translations. As I said, he's been translated several times, but I really like this. And this is the tra translation. Loho Kalam, tablet and pen. I shall not cease to feed this pen, but still keep record of what things pass through the soul. Still gather means for love to work its will. Keep green this age around which blank deserts roll. Though these days bitterness must grow sharper yet and tyrants not renounce their tyranny. And uh, with that, I want to thank again my quest. And of course, Kessler was a dear, dear friend and all of you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Moniza, for a very interesting portrayal of your father's life. Uh, his time and his, his works, uh, Faiz, Ahmed Faiz. Okay, we have a bit of time for any, for a question and answer session. So if anyone has any questions on any of the topics, uh, on any of the writers that uh, have been discussed um, in the past hour or so, you may ask your questions to the individuals. Uh, Asad, we have a question in the QA. There's one, shall I read it out? Sure, of course. Okay, Fares Ahmed Fares often said, purify your hearts so you can save the country. What does this quote mean to you, Sister Manasa? My father, uh, in his lifetime, and otherwise too, even today, we suffer. <laughs> So many people who find him a traitor, who find him, and so on and so forth. But I don't go into that. During his life, he uh, the poetry that you read, it's it's very deep, as I said, and it has Arabic and Persian uh, um, and Turkish also as well um, words in it, and so on and so forth. But he's he's always, if you look for it, there are two things in it. One, there is, I mean, he will paint unfortunate, the unfortunate picture of what is going around and what he wants to say. But the last couple of lines, we call them couplets, share, will always, always have a sense of optimism. That's one. Two, he always somehow connects whatever. You have to, as a reader, connect what you read to the country, to the nation, to the soil, to the people. That is what he was. Um, my father, I mean, I, I can't really say what he said and so on and so forth, but his, his always his, his connection was with Pakistan and Pakistan first, of course, but otherwise with all downtrodden people. He has written about Iran. He has written about Palestine. He has written about South Africa. He has written about Cuba. I mean, about the South, the South Americans and so on. There are poems there in which he, he has written about all the sufferings which he could find and hear and see. So I think that's basically the answer, that he's a poet of optimism, a poet of love, a poet of tolerance, and a poet of hope. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, have, I have one question myself. Uh, the other one was from Hanan. I'm a writer myself, as you know, Sister Manaza. And I'm fascinated to know what your life was like as a child growing up with a father, the sort of habits he had, what you thought about it as a five-year-old or four-year-old. I can only say, Kasra, that I have regrets, huge regrets, of not being able to grow up as with a normal childhood. 
simply for two reasons. One, of course, he was absent. He was in jail uh, and so on and so forth. Secondly, he was working in a press or working in a newspaper. That meant he was awake at night and asleep during the day, which is quite the other way around for normal children. Third, he was really, in a manner of speaking, with great love for him, not quite the normal father who would sit down and ask you, how, what did you do today in school? What did you read? What did you do? No, he, he was surrounded by people, surrounded by trade unionists, surrounded by workers, surrounded. And that job used, used obviously had to be with my mother or my aunt who was there with us and so on and so forth. So I have those regrets, definitely. You know, amazingly, I have grown to understand him more, love him more, rever him more, respect him more, adore him more after his departure, because I have been able to probably be a little more mature in my thinking, have a little more time on my hands, read a little bit. And what I'd just like to say, a last thing here, which will be possibly interesting for your listeners as well as for you. My book, um, which has now recently been completed, it is now with the designer, is something that you people might want to just hear about. It is based on his letters to me, which only I have seen and I have read. I have selected some of them. And I have called this book, Conversations with My Father. And I'm talking to him now, 40 years, almost after he's gone and telling him what my life, what I could not do to him then because he was busy and I was busy. So it's a very interesting um, genre of talking to a person who's no longer there, but for me, he's always there. And I am explaining to him how my life has, has happened after he departed. And I think that would be the answer to your question, is that I am actually reliving my life with him now. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. Do we have any questions for uh, regarding the other writers, uh, Gaetan, uh, Yunus Emery, or uh, Ibn Rushd as well? They are not posted here, but I think uh, some of our panelists can ask each other if they like about the yeah, authors no. that they've discussed. Feel free. And our attendees, if please, this is your chance. You've got 10 minutes. We want to make the most of these wonderful speakers. Uh, this is your chance to hear their comments. Anything anybody wants to ask about Ibn Rushd, for example? I May I just make a comment? Yes, yes. I, I have been amazed uh, finding out about these wonderful people that I didn't know about. I have been to Cordova, of course, and I've seen whatever, and I think I'm trying to remember, and I can actually see that, uh, that statue also somewhere or the other in my memory, but I will go back and I will do some more reading about this wonderful man. I had really no idea. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. You're welcome, Anisa. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you all. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Okay. Jess, uh, uh, would you like to comment or say anything about any of these authors? putting me on the spot yes I am. <laughs> it's, really yes, it's spot. been amazing hasn't it no I, I it's been absolutely amazing yeah no i've i've, I've actually been uh, in contact with uh, with gulson in the in the chat because i talked a little bit about the poetry library um that we're opening this year um and, and we're looking for for speakers and people who'd be prepared to perform in the library um, so I, I, I may well get in contact with, with various people after this event. So it has been, as I said, it would be. It's been really great to kind of hear these things and, and make the contacts. Okay, thank you. We have got a question now from Afsal Khan, mashallah, of our own day supporter of MacFest and our local MP. He says, this is to Manaza, how compatible do you think Marxist thought is with Islam? I'm sure you get that asked all the time. You'll have to unmute yourself. I know, I will. I am not going there, to be very honest, because my understanding of Marxism is definitely limited. And obviously my understanding of Islam has to be limited. I'm just a mere, mere mortal. I am a believer. I, am a, uh, I try to think of myself as a true Muslim, following in the footsteps of our prophet, peace be upon him and so on and so forth. But I really can't say that. I just believe in the humanity and in the peace and in the tolerance that Islam uh, speaks about. And I cannot imagine, and, and Marxism, I, I'm sorry, I really don't know. I have not read much about it, except that it talks, obviously uh, Islam talks about equality, 
Islam talks about human rights, Islam talks about equal rights, and Marxism talks about the same. That's as far as I would go, but really don't... Can, can, I, can I just ask, just uh, related to the question you've just been asked, um, perhaps a question did arise in some, some of our listeners and, and viewers' minds. Um, you mentioned he was a Marxist, your, your father, uh, but you also mentioned that he quoted from the Quran as well. And so I suppose the question is, you know, in near his end, did he die a Muslim? He was, <laughs> I will, if you're asking, did he pray five times a day? No, no I'm not asking you that. I just <laughs> asked if he, did, if he died a Muslim. He, he was died, he was, he was buried with the rituals of Islam, of course. And truly, truly. That's true. And he quoted, and, and let me also tell you that he was a Hafiz of Quran, Hafiz a Quran, uh, which is called uh, somebody who, who remembers the Quran by heart. He had to give it up after the fourth separa because his eyes became, he became a little weak in the eyes. But you don't that have was to justify this to anyone. Like, honestly, stuff all that we're even having this conversation about a man who has left a legacy of this stature is embarrassing. And I would like anyone who questions somebody's faith perspective to take a minute to examine themselves. You know what I mean? Seriously, Allah, maybe a hundred times before we come to that question. First, secondly, if you actually want to know a little bit more about Marxism and its relationship with Islam and where there are overlaps and in fact where the two may meet, I recommend maybe reading something like On the Sociology of Islam by Ali Shariati, who was one of the key figureheads of the Iranian uprising. Um, he was not somebody who I necessarily think would back the current strictures of the regime today, but if you look at his writings, they were deeply inspired by the egalitarianism, the fight back against poverty, the search for justice, which are all fundamentally Islamic principles. And so the idea that somehow you can come at questions as vast as is Islam compatible with Marxism displays, in my opinion, a profound arrogance. <laughs> like these are very complex systems of understanding of the world. And to think that somehow there wouldn't be any overlap in systems which ultimately seek to create justice one in a metaphysical principle level and the other in a materialist ones. Ya Rabbi, come on now. We'll come now really uh, to, the, to the end of this session. And as we come to the end uh, of this most stimulating session from what we've heard today, I hope this acts as inspiration for us to rebuild the intellectual base, which as we've seen is very much part of our tradition and one which is very much encouraged by our faith. Finally, on a personal note, when I was at school, I had a habit of reading the preface of the math and science textbooks. There was a mention of the Greeks, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, etc., and then the Renaissance, Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, etc. But never was there any mention of any other civilization contributing to the development of knowledge in any field. It was only when I picked up this book called Glories of Islam, which was written in 1958, uh, and I read this in the mid 70s, and later, of course, the 1001 Adventures by Professor Salim al Hassani, uh, that I learned the truth that Western prejudice was hiding. That's when I first heard of Ibn Rushd, Ibn Haytham, Zaharawi, Ibn Sina, Ibn Khaldun, etc., who were giants in their fields and who helped kickstart the awakening of Europe from the Dark Ages, otherwise known as the Renaissance. I can tell you the result of discovering this past had an enormous impact on me as a Muslim growing up in Britain in the 70s. I hope these sessions will act as inspirations for all of us to build that intellectual base, which we once had and made us a beacon of light for the world, both spiritual and intellectual. So to end with, thank you very much indeed for host, for uh, organizing these sessions and of course, MacFest to Sister Kaisra uh, and the rest of the team and May. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. Allah bless you for joining. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.